and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text for today is the gospel reading read just moments ago there on page 4 of your folder. The gospel according to St. Mark chapter 7 verses 31 through 37. This is our text. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Jesus has just been over in the area of the Gentiles, over in the area of Tyre and Sidon. Those are in modern day uh, Lebanon. If you look on an old Bible map, it'll say Phoenicia. Jesus has just been over there. It's very near to Galilee, which lies between that border and the Sea of Galilee. And he has been over there mixing with those that some would say he shouldn't be with. Remember, there were a lot of divisions that were laid out. And there were many Jews who were very pious about the fact that they were the saved. Remember, there was even that animosity with the Samaritans, their cousins to the north, or as the Jews would quickly point out, their half-cousins, because their cousins had married those who had been brought in during the Assyrian occupation and exile. Now Jesus goes beyond Samaria over into Phoenicia, and he does it for the specific reason of showing that the good news is for all people, not just for a select few. I believe that since he is coming from there, it is probably quite intentional that in our reading we are never told whether this man was a Jew, a Samaritan, or a Gentile, because it doesn't matter. The good news is for him no matter what. The healing is for him no matter who he is. And that is still the message of the church, or at least the message of God, and it needs to be the message of the church. As we take a look at today's reading, we're going to look at it a little bit more homiletically and work down through it. Jesus is bringing mercy and compassion into the life of someone who is in desperate need. He returned from the region over to the region of the Decapolis, and they brought to him a man who was deaf and had a speech impediment, and they begged him to lay his hand on him. Do you notice the very first thing in that line? They. Somebody cared about this guy. Somebody had heard about Jesus, and they brought him to Jesus. That is still very much the role of Christian people. You maybe know someone who is in desperate need. God doesn't require that you go fix that need. If you have the ability, he may use you in that way. But the most important thing, the very basic and foundational thing that you and I do is that we bring the needs of the people and we bring the people themselves to Jesus so that he can work his miraculous work. And yes, that includes the work of faith, a gift from God. If someone does not know about Jesus, neither you nor I will be able to convert their heart. But the Holy Spirit, through the word and through our friendship with that person, might very well begin to change their life. It is Jesus that they need to meet. It is the Savior that they need to meet. And so like these friends, however many there were, we bring the needs to Jesus. The man was deaf and had a speech impediment. Perhaps it was something that was uniquely about his ability to speak. Perhaps he had just a little bit of hearing. If you've ever heard a person who is deaf try to speak, the sound sounds a little bit differently. Well, why is that? Because they mimic what they hear. That's how all of us learn to speak. We sit in front of a baby and we go, ma, ma, dad, da, and we want them to repeat that. That's the way that we learn language. And if it sounds different in our ears, it's going to come out of our mouth a little bit differently as well. The man had a problem of deafness and he was mute. If you talk to people who have various disabilities or handicaps or challenges, whatever we're calling them these days, you will discover that among deaf people, there is a real sense of need. They will be quick to tell you that other handicaps may keep you from doing particular things, but deafness 
cuts you off from other people. It denies you the opportunity for community. So this man was in a terrible way. And because he could not hear, what did he have to rely on? He didn't have bell tone or some hearing aids or cochlear implants in those days. He had to see what was going on. And so Jesus, Jesus treats him personally and individually as he does with each of us. And he takes the man aside. He takes him away from the crowd. Number one, he's not a spectacle for everyone to observe. And most importantly, that will keep the man from all of the distractions that he will see going along. Jesus wants his undivided attention. So he takes him away from the rest of the people and he looks him squarely in the face. And there's a connection there. And Jesus signs to him, if you will, what he is going to do. He puts his fingers into his ears, and then he spits, a sign some often thinking of spit having to do with healing powers. And then he touches his tongue. He lets the man know what it is that he's going to be doing. He couldn't have just told the man. He wouldn't have heard him. So he shows the man and uses his senses. Jesus then looks up to heaven, the place where all true blessings and all miracles come from, and he sighs. So why are we told that he sighs? Well, that is that deep part of the soul that has a connection with God, the spirit. As he looks toward heaven, not only is he probably sighing because of all of the effects that sin brings upon individuals and the world, but he's also sighing because he is ready to do a great work, and he is ready to present this man and his needs to the Heavenly Father. He gives a deep sigh and says, Ephatha, that is, be opened. That really is the Lord's prayer for every one of us. Sin has indeed cut us off from community. It isolates us as individuals. It cuts us off from God. Sin, indeed, hardens our hearts to many things, especially to the Word of God. And we end up with a problem of spiritual deafness. But the God of all creation would not have us remain apart from Him. Indeed, He is very persistent about His desire to be back at one with us. And that's the whole reason why He sent His Son, isn't He? To bring us back together with God again, and together in God, then together with one another. Indeed, he wants to restore fellowship. He wants to restore us to our Heavenly Father, and repair that relationship that was broken so long ago, that is lived out in the brokenness of our daily interactions with one another. And so, Jesus gives a heavy sigh, as he says, be opened. Indeed, the man's whole life is opened up. Not only are his ears opened so that he can hear, not only is his tongue set free so that he may speak, but there's the unmentioned blessing here of the healing of his mind. Think about it. The man wouldn't have known what words were really supposed to sound like. We're told that he spoke clearly. Not only did God grant to him the blessing of hearing and speaking, but he also gave him what he needed to know in order to act as if he had been speaking for years and years. He knew the sound of the words. He knew the way to put them together. And isn't that always the way it is with our God of blessings? There are always far more than meet the eye. We may pick out the ones that are obvious, but behind the scenes and deep underneath, there are always more, always more blessings that he has given, always more blessings over which we are to rejoice. How do you suppose it felt for that man to hear and speak for the first time? How do you suppose that it was for him as he was returned to community again, 
that he could spend his time in a group of people or sit quietly with friends because the Lord of all creation had restored to him health of body, soul, and spirit. What do you suppose it was like for him? I suppose that his heart was very grateful, grateful beyond measure. I suppose that even though there were probably days when he didn't specifically think about, oh, I want to be grateful to God for this or that, I would suppose that he lived the rest of his life with a certain amount of gratitude and freedom. How could he ever forget a day like this? How could he ever forget a man named Jesus who had looked him squarely in the eyes and conquered sin and all of its consequences for him? So it is for you and me. When we have experienced the Lord Jesus and the grace of God, how can our lives go on the same? He has looked us squarely in the eyes and spoken our names and made us his own. He has splashed our bodies with the water. And today, he comes again to touch our bodies with the very body and blood of the Lord Jesus, to give that new life and healing into us physically and illustrate to us what it is that he has done and is doing for us on the spiritual level. Jesus dealt with that man as a whole person. God deals with you and me as whole people. Do you suppose our lives can go on the same after we have gathered here in this place in the name of the Lord? After we have heard that our sins are forgiven and we've received the body and blood of the Lord Jesus, do you suppose we can march out those doors or the ones at the end of the hallway and go back to business as usual? If we do, we have not understood grace at all. Sometimes it is difficult for us, isn't it, to keep our mind on those godly things. And sometimes the troubles and the needs that come into our life and the lives of those around us distract us from what is most important, our relationship with God himself, one that he has graciously established for us and with us. But how can our lives go on the same? They cannot. Jesus has looked the devil squarely in the face and has defeated him. And his overcoming, his victory is yours and mine. Our overcoming of the evil one. Our victory over sin, death, and the grave. As we keep the cross of Jesus Christ before us, there is no doubt that the one who has come with the recompense of God to heal and to save, to restore and to refresh, understands our woes. You can see it in his very body. He knows the consequences of sin even more deeply than you and I. But there is also no doubt about the mercy and compassion of this God who comes for the likes of you and me, for those who do not know him, for those who know him and scorn him, for those who never think about him, but they carry his name around and say they're Christians. He comes for each of us, offering mercy and compassion and inviting us to be embraced by, by his grace. You and I are the heirs of a great treasure. You and I are the ones who have been touched by Jesus. And while we may not see victory over all of our enemies in this world, it doesn't mean that they are not defeated. And on that last great day, he will call you by name and me by name and usher us into the fullness of all that he has desired for us from before the foundation of the world. That, my friends, is an awesome story, a story that seems scary to share when we're told to go out and evangelize. And yet when we look at our ordinary life and simply take that joy with us, that message is easily shared as we comfort and encourage those around us. And as we seek to bring them to Jesus, 
that he may work his miraculous work. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. 